issues. So thank you and welcome and uh, Well, thank you, Phyllis and Donna and the Historical Society for having me here. Uh, what a great honor it is to, to speak with you and share with you some of um, the research that's been exciting me lately and some of the work that we do out in Haena. Um, are you guys okay if I stand right here? I'm hoping to avoid going on stage. You guys okay with that? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so I just wanted to pause and uh, take a moment to honor Uncle Bruce Wickman, who's a uh, I'm sure to many of you in the room who are familiar with uh, him and maybe had the honor of knowing him in, in his lifetime. He recently passed away and saw some of you at his uh, funeral last night. But, um, you know, Uncle Bruce has dedicated his life to uh, recording and documenting the history of Kauai. And um, I couldn't give a talk tonight without uh, at least honoring him. And so I just wanted to stand for a moment of silence in uh, honor of Uncle Bruce. Okay, mahalo. Um, before I get into um, the things I, were I was really going to talk about tonight, I have to share some of the work that Uncle Bruce has uh, helped us to, um, has inspired us to, to work on recently. And um, towards the later part of last year, I think it was about November, uh, it was right before he passed, I believe, and um, we were working on some other indigenous mapping initiatives and one of the things that uh, Uncle Bruce had collected in his lifetime were the many place names, as you know, including the place names that's of, of the ridges and the peaks that stood as the borders between all the different ahupua'a. And in Haena, if you guys have been out to Haena, it's all the way at the end of the road. And the next ahupua'a over is Hanakapiai. So one of the um, things that Uncle Bruce documented in, in his, uh, his life's work is the different peak names. And we never really knew where all of the peaks were. We obviously knew Makana, which is the most famous mountain, and we knew Mount Noho and Mount Upulo'u, but then you look at the list of names, and they're a little more than that, just a list of names and a paper, and um, they're just so nebulous when you have, when you look at this, a ridge line like this, and you're like, what name goes where, and um, so it's always almost been too complex to really delve into, and uh, you know, me and a whole bunch of other people said, ah, oh, we'll get to that one day, um, but it all kind of opened up somehow in November, and uh, this is what I would do at night between 11 and 2 when my kids were sleeping. Um, but I, I, just, I just felt this uh, inspiration within me to start really looking into it. And I remember, thought back to some of the things that my elders would uh, say to me is, it's all in the language. So just kind of try and disconnect and reconnect to that and, and see what happens. And so I brought it to, my, to um, the portion of my career at Limahuli that works in, in the back valley. And I said, okay, you know, let's... We have this opportunity here to, to try and figure these out, and, um, and, and you know, the elders are right, it is all in the language, and so we knew this one, we knew these two, but everything else, like, oh, what goes where, and we, we kind of knew the sequential order, but we didn't know which is a peak, which is a ridge, and things like that, and I told my guys, if we can just figure out the one in the middle, then we can maybe get some context, and so we put all the names out, and we're looking at um, different pictures like this of the valley, and we got to the one peak called Namanamana, like Banamana Lima, or Banamana means branching or things like that. So I was telling my crew, okay, it's either something that's super branched or it looks like fingers. And we're just looking at pictures and I saw Pookoko, that means bloody head. So if you see something that looks like bloody head, let me know. And we're just going through all the names and because um, in the last ridge was named Kalapahalulu, which means the kind of the roaring, the roaring cliff, for lack of a better uh, translation. Um, but it's a point on, in the upper valley, so this is way up in the mountains, from which you can hear both Limahuli Falls and Hanakapiai Falls at the same time. So there's this one somewhere, we didn't know where. And so we're looking at pictures and I was kind of explaining what I thought these translations were and, and one of my guys said, hey, that one kind of looks like fingers. And he pointed to this one and it kind of looks like fingers pointing up, but if you kind of turn your hand like this and put your knuckles at a funny angle, these ridges right here actually look like the, the knuckles on your fingers. 
And these, uh, or these peaks look like knuckles on your fingers, and these ridge, ridges coming down kind of look like your fingers coming down like this. It's like, and my guy said that, I said, that's the mana mana. I was so excited, we figured it out. And then the next one above, Pococo, bloody head. So we're looking, 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 and said, well, this is the craziest peak we have in the whole valley. And if you're gonna climb that thing, you're probably gonna end up with a bloody head. So it makes sense, that's probably Pococo. Um, and then we figured out, and they were in the upper valley the last trip they took up there in December. Um, I have this one particular crew, they fly up in a helicopter every two weeks to try and take care of the native birds and the, and the plants and things like that. And I said, okay, when you guys walk down the ridge line, make sure you be quiet and listen. And sure enough, they, they, they went with that intent. They walked down the ridge line and quietly and got to a point where they could hear one waterfall. Said, okay, I hear one, but not two, and going, going, going. And then they got to it. It's just a saddle between these two hills. It was about a 20-meter stretch, so maybe about the width of this room. And that's the only place that you could hear both waterfalls at the same time, Kalapahalulu. And so thank you, Uncle Bruce, for his life's work. And um, we now have a good idea of what our ridge names are and peak names and things like that. Um, but you know, we don't only, the indigenous mapping projects that we're doing in Haena, we don't only look at the mountains, we look at the ocean, and this is uh, the latest rendition of one of our place name maps. Um, we are very fortunate to ha still have elder master fishermen in the community who know the place names of the reefs and the channels and things like that. And uh, when Chipper Wickman, my predecessor, was the director at Limahuli in the late 90s to the early 2000s, he initiated an indigenous mapping project um, and got together with one of these uh, master elders, Uncle Tom Hashimoto, and recorded his knowledge of the place names of the reefs and the channels and the different fishing spots. And with, when they were done with that draft of the map in 2003, there was about 50 names on that map. So about 90% of those 50 years, 55 names, I think it was, uh, Uncle Tom, he, those were the things that he was taught by his father. And he would always say, you know, there's more names. I just remember the spots that my dad would take me fishing at, but there's, there's more names. He'd always say that. And so, you know, I've been at Limahuli for 10 years now, and as I've been spending time with different elders and different families, I'd hear other names come up, and I'd hear a name, I was like, oh, that, that name's not on our map. And then I'd, I'd be going through um, the old Hawaiian language newspapers, and I'd see a name and say, oh, that, that name's not on our map. So it, we finally got a time, and it's, I just told myself, well, we gotta just make a, update this uh, map already. And so right around the same time, uh, ended up being in December when we finalized this map, and we have now uh, more than 65 uh, names that go along our coastline, uh, storied places and things like that. Um, you know, each of them has, has stories. Some of them we know, some of them we don't know. Some of them we have ideas of what they are. Uh, we know this channel right here. Can you guys see that right here? The name of that channel is called Poholokeki, which means the drowning child. So. It maybe gives you a heads up, you shouldn't have your kids play over there in the wintertime because what happens in the wintertime when the giant waves come, comes in over this reef and it comes in over this reef and all of that, how many tons of water coming in on the reef, it has to go out somewhere. And the place it goes out is this channel. Uh, and you know, that's called a rip current, we all know what rip currents are and there's channels all over the place with rip currents all over the place. But the slight nuance of where this rip current takes you is it'll, if you get stuck in the rip current, it'll take you out here and it'll put you in another current which takes you down the coast. Whereas if you're in this one, you get sucked out, but you can always just swim back in. If you're over here, you get sucked out, you can swim in. But this one, you get sucked out, and you get put right into another current that takes you down the coast. And so if you're a small child who doesn't know how to swim, um, it probably records some, something of our history that records lessons and things like that. Um, but then the beach in front of that, right here, is called Holoholokeiki. So what does Holoholokeiki mean? That's the place where the kids go and play, and it's a beautiful place. The stream is there, the sand dunes, the forest, and it's just a natural playground for the kids. It's my, where I, my kids love to go and play when we're down there. And they kind of, it's, it's kind of looking at the lessons of the, what the place tells you. There's, this is Holoholokeiki, this is Poholokeiki. So you guys stay on the Holoholo side. Don't go out on the Poholo side, because you know what's gonna happen. Um, so these are the kind of lessons that place names uh, uh, teach us and uh, help us to understand you know, many different things, and one, just one of them is helping your children understand where it's safe to play and, and other things, but uh, a lot of other uh, uh, tidbits of knowledge that are, uh, um, that these place names are the repository of, and these are some of the things that we work on in Limahuli, and this isn't what I came here to talk about tonight, but um, so much of this work is a part of Uncle Bruce's legacy, and I just wanted to honor him with uh, sharing some of that. Um, 
So on to the stuff that I really meant to talk about. Um, before I really go on, I, I have to kind of take a moment and pause and reflect on uh, one of our proverbs about learning in, in Hawaiian. It says, nana ikikumu, nana ikikumu. That's what my elders would always tell me. When you're learning something, you go to the source of that knowledge. You don't go to somebody who kind of understands what they're talking about because you're only going to get a, a subset of that knowledge and not understand the entirety of it. So that, that's what was done in the Hawaiian culture as knowledge was being passed on. It would be from kumu to student, from the source of the knowledge to the student. And that's how you maintain the integrity of your, of your knowledge. And I need to acknowledge my kumu, my kumu hula, was John Kaimikawa, um, the, last in a, uh, the last keeper in a line of uh, priestly knowledge that dated back to the ninth century on Molokai. Uh, he passed away in 2006. And here's my tutu ho'okama, uh, Erika Ana'ana from Milolii Ho'opuloa in South Kona on Hawaii Island. Um, and then lastly, the Aina itself has always been a teacher of mine. Um, I grew up on Oahu and I grew up in a place, you know, for a large part of my life I went to a private school, so I went to a school outside of my community. And the particular area where we lived in the neighborhood, there were no kids my age, but there was a forest on the other side, and so I spent a lot of time in the forest. And, you know, I always say, like, the trees were my friends, and I go in the forest with my dog, and um, that's how I grew up. You know, I was heavily influenced from, from the forest and, and the aina. And um, these are three of the main uh, influences on the work that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, if I say anything that's wrong, the fault is mine, not theirs. Uh, so I ask forgiveness if, if there's anything that I uh, misstate. Um, I'm going to be sharing some perspectives, again, from Haena and, and the work that we do out there. The work we, that we do from the mountains to the ocean, one of the few places uh, that we're, we're still active, um, a community is still active all the way from the mountains out into the ocean. Um, so much of the work that we do out there stands on the concept of aloha aina. Aloha aina is, is, is a concept of having the same level of aloha for the aina itself and all of its resources as you do as, for your own family members. Um, it's an uh, ancient tradition that uh, we still continue to live out in Haena, and I'm very fortunate and blessed to, to be a part of the work out there. Um, just in case there's anybody in the room who doesn't know where Haena is, uh, it's in the moku of Halelea. Uh, right there's the Ahupua'a, so it's, it's one of eight or so Ahupua'a in Haena, I mean in Halelea, all the way out at the border between Hanakapiai. So that those ridges that I showed you earlier represent the boundary markers right here, going up uh, the boundary between not only the Ahupa'a but the Moku as well. Um, this is another perspective of Haena from, from the air, from a satellite image. And you can see the, the part that's not shaded out is the Ahupa'a of Haena. This area right here um, with its, this crazy polygon, that's the land that I'm in charge of managing with my team. Uh, this is Limahuli Garden and Preserve. For those of you who have actually been to Limahuli Garden on a, and Saturday's come on today, so come on by. Um, this is Limahuli Garden right here. So if you've ever been there, it gives you some context of understanding. Outside of the garden, we have this lower valley, which is about 600 acres, and that goes all the way to the back of the valley. There's an 800-foot waterfall over here. Don't tell anybody. Um, this isn't being recorded, right? <laughs> Um, and then above the waterfall, we have another 600, uh, 400 acres here, and that upper 400 acres is still intact, montane cloud forest. We still have native birds. We have endangered ground nesting seabirds. We have both the uwa'u and the um, a'o. Um, and then, so a lot of the work that we do up here, we fenced off this area. We're protecting it uh, from the pigs and such, and um, doing a lot of habitat protection in the upper valley. And in the lower valley here, where there's uh, a lot of degraded sites, uh, the hurricanes have destroyed the forest and things like that, we're doing habitat restoration. So habitat protection in the upper valley, habitat restoration in the lower valley. Um, and in the garden is where we interpret our work. A lot of people think that the garden is all that we do, but really the garden is just the, a small piece of our work and, and the venue that we have to educate about our mission and, and the work that we do. Um, just wanted to point out that these polygons over here, I'll be talking uh, more about those later, but those are mapped archaeological sites. This is an agricultural complex, uh, amazing system of terraces that were for, most likely for tower production, terraces all the way back here, house sites, religious sites, things like that. Um, but the valley floor is just chock full with those. Um, 
just for a matter of perspective, anybody who hasn't been to the garden but maybe been out to Haena, uh, Camp Nawe is right over here. Camp Nawe is the border between uh, Haena and Wainiha. And a, lot, a lot of people don't realize that this whole area over here is all technically in the Ahupua of Wainiha. Um, this is Ke'e, where the Nepali Trail starts and things like that. So just a little bit of perspective. Whoops. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we're the blessed to be uh, the stewards of is an amazing repository of biodiversity. And Limahuli has the amazing designation of being the second most biodiverse valley in the entire state of Hawaii. Anybody guess what number one is? It's Kalalau. So Kalalau is uh, right here. It's an amazing hot spot of biodiversity. This is Limahuli Valley, and this is our upper valley over here where we do the habitat protection. Um, we have documented 260 taxa of native plants and several native birds still, including endangered ones. So we're, we're one of the hot spots of biodiversity and we know that Kauai is the hot spot of um, the Hawaiian Island chain and the Hawaiian Island chain is a hot spot in the Pacific. So uh, Kauai and this side of the island is the hot spot of the hot spot of the hot spot. And uh, we're fortunate enough to um, be working in this place and, and be charged with uh, protecting the uh, ecology of the area and the cultural traditions that are uh, found here. Um, so this kind of goes to our vision of what we do out at Limahuli and our vision is to be a puhonua and a puhonua is a term in Hawaiian that means a place of refuge. It's a place that you go when for some reason or another you find there's turmoil all around you and you need to get back to a place to get back to balance and that's basically what we try and do at Limahuli. We want to be a place it's a, we want to be a valley that's a place of refuge for the native plants, um, the cultural traditions, and we want to be a thriving social ecological system uh, which is shared and embraced by the world. So uh, a, a huge part of our mission is education and interpreting the work that we do, but we want to do it in such a way that people understand the importance not only for native Hawaiians, but also for communities in Hawaii, and there's a lot of lessons in global sustainability as well. Um, and the way that we do that is looking at ahupua based management and being an example and a model of how ahupua based management is uh, viable in the 21st century. Um, so ahupua, you hear that word all around nowadays, it's kind of ubiquitous. Uh, it's a buzzword, it's used by um, politicians and, and other people. And one thing that, you know, some of you may have seen this poster is put out by Kamehameha Schools in the 1970s and this is kind of the first visual representation of Ahupua in a long time. And we look at it, here's some terra farming, here's a fish pond and the houses and things like that. Um, so a lot of, of, of this part of the Ahupua in the lowlands where there's farming and fishing and habitation, there's, there's quite a bit known about that and documented and that makes a lot of sense if you're talking about Ahupua restoration, okay, restore the lo'i, restore the fish pond. Um, but it's a lot more than that because there's some major components of Ahupua in the system and the function that aren't really well understood, um, such as how are these logistically managed in, in the context of a thriving population of uh, perhaps a million people? How, are the, how is agroforestry managed, the inland resources, the forest? How are all these managed in the Ahupua context? Is that's a kind of a glaring hole in our understanding. And I'm in a position where I'm, in, I'm kind of charged with using the Ahupua system as a model. And like I was saying, in the areas where we have taro patches, okay, you gotta restore the taro patch. If there's a fish pond, restore the fish pond. But what do I do with the rest of the thousand acres that's all forest? How do I manage that in the context of Ahupua'a? Um, I, don't, I didn't really have any, any guidebooks or any reference books or anything. So that's kind of the research that I'm going to be sharing about tonight, how, how I figured some of this out, and uh, the pieces of the puzzle that I've been putting together and seeing the, the picture that's emerging. Um, so of course, you know, whenever you start out this kind of research, you go back to your old standards. Anything that uh, Tutu Pukui has ever wrote, David Malo, Samuel Kamakao, um, get as much as you can out of there, but there's quite a bit more. So looking deeper, um, I'm not sure if you guys have had any talks on the Hawaiian language newspapers. Um, have you guys in historical society talked about that much? Kind of not really, not really. It's an amazing treasure trove of, of knowledge. And um, the first Hawaiian language newspapers came out in 1834. And this was, I, you know, if you go to the, those, the missionary houses in, in on Honolulu, you go on the tour and they talk about how 
Um, Hawaii got a printing press, was the first place west of the Mississippi to get a printing press and all this stuff. And, um, you know, missionaries came in 1820, started printing Bibles, and the technology of reading was adopted extremely quickly. And the kingdom got up to 98% literacy rate, which is uh, one of the highest ever recorded in the world. And so then this new technology of newspapers came out. And, you know, it, the newspapers served a function of just as much of uh, conveying the news of the day as it was documenting traditional knowledge. So you maybe had the front page of the news, but all the other inlays of the paper were um, like a serial reproduction of these uh, amazing oral histories that were published as uh, serial uh, publications for over the course of two, three, sometimes four years. Um, there's various versions of the story of Hiyaki Kopolio Pele and Cavello from Kauai, and these things ran for years in the papers, and people would buy the papers, almost not so much to get the news, but to just read what was next in the story. And these weren't stories that were made up in 18, 1840s, 1870s. These were things that would have been told for gener countless generations and finally being uh, documented in, in uh, written form. Um, so, you know, when I was uh, going to uh, University of Hawaii, you know, late 90s and things like that, when we wanted to look into the newspapers, we actually had to go through a library and look through microfiche and just practically go blind, almost a shot in the dark of what you're going to find. Um, but now, uh, you know, we have digital technology and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has funded this big uh, research project. It's called Papakilo and you can look it up and you can do all kinds of amazing searches digitally. They've digitized, I don't know if they've finished digitizing the newspapers, but they've done a heck of a lot. And what you can do is, you know, they'd scan a newspaper and you get kind of digitized as a PDF, but what good is a PDF when you're searching? So then they also have another program that they run on top of that that turns all of the text into a Word doc. So if I wanted to do any kind of research about my area, I, all I have to do is type in Limahuli and every, any occurrence that the word Limahuli has ever occurred in the old Hawaiian language newspapers will all come up on the screen. Um, and that's, like I said, that's what I spend between 11 o'clock and 2 in the morning sometimes just doing these word searches and, and uh, trying to find out things. Uh, but it's an amazing treasure trove, uh, treasure trove. A lot of these things have never been published before. And so for researchers like me, it's, it's just an amazing way to kind of gain insight from the past. Um, and like I said, you start to, whatever you're looking at, you're, we can get a more clearer picture because we're able to look into these archival resources. Um, so we were talking about ahupua and how this is a model. Um, you might hear me, or you will hear me and see this term, social ecological system. Um, that's kind of a fancy academic term that acknowledges that people are a part of systems and to talk about an ecosystem kind of cuts people out of the equation and draws a line where there really is no line. And so when I'm talking about ahupua, it really is looking at a social ecological system, looking at people are a part of this from the mountains all the way out to the ocean. And so how did this all work together? Um, like I said, it's been, it's used a lot by resource managers, policymakers. You hear the mayor talking about it all the time. Um, but our modern understanding of what ahupua were is based on a lot of assumptions and sometimes it's based on ideals that we have of this utopian Hawaiian culture where everybody's singing, dancing, and having fun, and, uh, but it's really, it wasn't really like that. Um, so there's some innovative research that's coming out. I'm going to be sharing some that have been done from uh, some of my friends and some people I look, look up to a lot as well as uh, some of my own research. Um, so to talk about some of the assumptions about ahupua, I think we all have an image in our mind if we've heard that word before. But this is a kind of the stereotypical, not stereotypical, but the kind of prototypical image of an ahupua. And they always talk about it as it's a pie-shaped land division and that was uh, based on watershed lines and you had forests above and a stream running through it and then farms and houses and, you know, right? Doesn't that fit with a lot of our understandings of what ahupua were? Um, and, and probably in a lot of cases, this, this was uh, what happened, but certainly not all. And so one of the things that some of us have been doing is starting to attest, uh, test these assumptions um, and seeing if uh, they're actually real, um, played out in reality. So the assumption one is that ahupua are pie-shaped land division that goes from the mountain to the sea. The reality is that that was just one of several types of ahupua. Um, the mountain to the sea one, but then we had some, especially on the higher islands, the younger islands of Hawaii Island and Maui, where you had these huge 10,000 foot, 13,000 foot volcanoes, 
the Ahupua'a didn't go all the way to the top of the summit, it kind of went up to the middle of the forest and then, and then went down. So you had Ahupua'a that went from the middle of the mountain all the way down to the ocean. Um, you had ones that went across the island, and you, f you find this especially on the lower islands where you don't really have tall mountains, it kind of just went across the whole thing, or like on Molokai where it's high on one side and low on the other, you'd have some that just went right as a band right across. Um, you have exam crazy example of landlocked ahupua, and I don't understand how really those work, but there were some. You have some ahupua that are only along the coast, so no access to mountain resources, and how do those work? I don't know, but it definitely wasn't a pie shape. Um, and some of them are split into lele, and this isn't something, uh, this is coming out of Gunshore and Beamer's latest research, um, and it's not something that I fully understand, but I, especially on Maui, they have these examples of ahupua that are classified as lele, which means you have one piece of your ahupua over here, and you have somebody else's ahupua, then you're another piece of your ahupua over here. And you're like, how does that work? Um, so I have some ideas in my head about what, how that came to be and how that might have worked, but I haven't really done any research in that area, so I'll probably hold my speculations to myself at this point. Um, and so that's the second assumption is that ahupua are based on watersheds. Yeah, we've all heard that. Um, here's an ahupua map of Oahu. And the reality is that the majority of Ahupua do not follow watershed lines. Um, only about 5% do. And the majority of these are on the older islands of Oahu and Kauai, and you can figure these are the ones that are most eroded, where we, we have clear delineations between valleys and, and watersheds, and there's actually quite a bit um, uh, on these older islands. But when you get to a place like Hawaii Island, you look at Kona, if you like stand back and look at Kona, it's pretty much all flat. You know, like, I don't know, where would you put an ahupua? You know, it's, it's kind of, uh, what do you do in those senses where you don't have clear valley walls and things like that? Um, uh, the third assumption being that a stream always runs through it. Uh, the reality is that maybe sometimes. Um, if you, again, looking at the example of Kona, there's 194 ahupua in all of Kona and not one stream. So, no streams uh, in the Ahupua of Kona. And then you look on the other side of the island, Hilo Hamakua Coast, the streams are actually the borders of the Ahupua. They're not in the middle like um, in, in our area on Kauai, um, where streams are usually the middle. So I just imagine that. How, is that. how does that work when a stream is the border? Ah, it kind of makes my brain want to explode. Um, so testing another assumption, assumption number four, is that you always have agriculture below, agriculture and development, your farming and your housing is always on the low ends and the forest is always above. Um, and I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of Peter Vatusik. He's an amazing researcher. He runs a lab in Stanford, and he does, he's actually a Hawaii boy. He grew up in Kailua on Oahu. Um, and he's been doing a lot of research in, in uh, South Kohala, and they have this amazing field system there that they basically rediscovered just, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But you see these undulating fields over here? At some point, him and a friend said, oh, let's go check out. I hear the, these, these kind of mounds in the landscape. And they go and walk up this one pu'u, and they look at it, and this is what they see. Like, this cannot be natural. But then they go out, and they talk to the elders of the area. And this has been a Paniolo land for, I don't know, 150 years. I don't know. But it had gotten to the point where they couldn't find a living elder who had any idea what this was. It got to the point where the Paniolos just figured that's the way the land was in this area. Um, and so they started to do some research and figure out, okay, what was this for? And um, had this theory that it was for sweet potato agriculture. And this is in the uplands, you know, this is not down by the ocean. Um, and so what happens there, uh, there's no streams and the only source of water, the majority of the water around actually comes over the landscape is um, kind of mist. So the clouds come in low, um, like by YPO area and then come up and then they just kind of rake down the landscape. And if you want to farm, the trick is you got to catch that water. And so what uh, Peter and uh, or Peter Vatusik and his lab have come to is it seems like these were all a massive, and I think it's something like 14 miles long. Um, this was for sweet potato agriculture. So what they think happened was in in these mounds, and these are about you know maybe from me to the door apart or so. Um, it, what the, their theory is that um, in the tops of these mounds, these are rock mounds, and that would be, have planted sugarcane in it. And in the middle of the mounds, you'd be uh, planting um, sweet potatoes. And so as this mist is raking over the landscape, 
you have these rows of sugarcane that are basically raking the moisture out of the air, collecting it on their leaves, and it's kind of blowing, the wind's blowing like this, and it's collecting moisture, and it's almost like this uh, sprinkler that's going 24-7, just, just uh, flicking water back. And, you know, I went up there myself, and I'm like, man, this is way too cold for sweet potatoes. I've been growing sweet potatoes my whole life. There's no way sweet potatoes are going to grow up here. But sweet potatoes, it, he calls it the breadbasket of, of sweet potatoes. You can pull up like a little area like this, and it's just mind-blowing the amount of sweet potatoes you can get out of that area. So, um, and, you know, according to his calculations, they've published on this, but um, this is such a productive system that it rivals the most productive continental systems like you see in the breadbasket of continental uh, U.S., but definitely producing an amazing amount of food. And right when, when I was up here there about, I think, a year or two ago on a site visit with them, um, they are telling this story, and I remembered this story that my kumuhula told me about the story of Lani Kaula, who was this famous prophet on the island of uh, Molokai, and he was taken for a time into the, the royal court of Kamalala Valu, and he was his uh, most prized prophet in Kahuna and things like that. And Kamalala Valu, at a time, he wanted to kind of attack the big island and take over, the, uh, over there, and, and he consulted all of his Kahuna, and they all said, oh yes, if you go, you'll be victorious. And then Lani Kaula was the only one, he said, if you go, you'll meet your death. And then so, he trusted Lani Kaula the most, and so he said, well, you, all these other guys are saying that I'm going to be victorious, but Lani Kaula is saying I'm going to meet my death, so I better look into this. So he sent some spies over there, and spies went over and pretended like they're fishermen, they're in a sailing canoe, and they went out along the Kohala coast, and um, they came back and they reported, all they saw was trees. They said, and they came back to Kamala Lavalu, and they said, if you attack, you got to go through Kohala, because there's nothing but trees over there. I don't see, we didn't see any one single person you go through, Kohala, and you will be victorious. And then so he brought everybody together again and said, or he talked to Lani Kaula and he said, look, I got all of my kahuna telling me I'm going to be victorious. I sent my spies over there. They tell me this is the way to go. And you're the only one who is telling me that I'm going to meet my death. And so this is when uh, Lani Kaula gave the, spoke the famous words, lei kohala ika nuku naka naka, which means kohala is overflowing with people. And he's like, there's no way you'll take it. But at this point, uh, Kamalala Valu had figured that Lani Kaula was out to get him and he banished him from this court and sentenced him to death and Lani Kaula had to flee to Molokai and um, the story goes on over there, it's a whole other presentation. But, so Kamalala Valu went to attack Kuhala and he went over there and there were so many people, they were decimated. And what Lani Kaula told him was that your spies went at the wrong time. If they would have went at night, they would have seen all the fires lit in the uplands where everybody is, they don't live in the lowlands. And I never really understood that story. You know, I was young at this time. It's like, how does that work where you show up to a place and it's covered in forest, but there's still a lot of people there? And then I actually went on this site visit, and this is why. There's this whole area. The forest is down here. And the farms are all the way at the top of the mountains. And, you, and if you go down by the coast, you cannot see it. All you see is trees. And so I was like, wow, that's what, that's what this story was talking about. So it's all these little things that um, kind of, you know, modern scientific research is just, kind of giving validation to all of our cultural history and it's really exciting to be, to see it and be a part of it in some ways. Um, anyway, back to this. So testing assumption number five is that, you know, we hear this all the time that Ahupua sustainably provide for all of the needs of its people. Um, but the reality is that it's uh, not an enclosed system. And um, my good friend Kamana Beamer, who is a co-author on that paper I keep citing, um, we were in this debate going back and forth that I was, I used to be one of the people who thought that Ahupua was self-sufficient, it could provide for all the needs and he, you know, we just go back and forth and finally he said, okay, what about Ko'i? So Ko'i are the add stones that we need to carve our canoes and cut down trees and all this stuff and Ko'i, the add stone, you don't find that in every Ahupua, they're only in certain places and certain veins in the, in the geology of the landscape and if you're going to function, you need Ko'i, but if you can't get them from your place, you're not self-sufficient. So um, that's just one example of, of how Ahupua really aren't enclosed systems. But the reality is um, when you look at natural resources, whether it's native birds or native trees or fish, they don't pay attention to Ahupua boundaries. They're going to go wherever they're going to go. And um, to really understand and, and manage these populations of fish and birds and trees that, that communities need, you have to really know the, the kind of landscape and the population dynamics and how they flowed. And, and Ahupua had to work together to make sure that things were always abundant. Um, the reality also is that Ahupua ranged from very wealthy in a Hawaiian concept to very destitute. There were some uh, famous Ahupua. 
um, but they talk about how, how poor they are, that they can't even feed the, the, the people who come and visit, and they have to look down at their knees and, and pretend like they don't see them. So we know that even in the old days, there were very abundant and wealthy ahupua, and we know there were some that were also very destitute. Um, so anyway, those were our assumptions, and they all just got blown out of the water. So what we're really starting to see is that we need a better working definition of ahupua. The one we have been using is really founded on these assumptions and ideals that just aren't true. And this is something that I you know, keep up, uh, stay up at night thinking about. But really, so what we're looking like ahupua are is a community level uh, land division component that has been imp implemented in various ways throughout the islands, uh, is a part of a larger social ecological system. We got the moku in the different districts and um, the aim of it was maximizing resource availability and abundance. And so that's kind of the operating def definition that I'm using uh, nowadays, and uh, I'm on a mission to get other people to embrace it as well. Um, but you know, what's really exciting is that um, I have a lot of contemporaries and friends who are, who are also kind of doing this, th these uh, research in this realm, and we get to challenge each other on, on, on uh, coming to better definitions of things. But anyway, this is Ahupua of Haena, where Lim Huli is located. This is an artist's rendition of how the Ahupua would have looked like in the old days, in pre-contact times. Uh, everything, a lot of things in here are based on archaeological evidence. Oops. Um, these taro patches over here, the taro patches that you see when you first come to the garden. A lot of house sites up on the hillside. The heiau, or the temple dedicated to Hula. Over here, the guys climbing up the mountain to perform the sacred Oahi ceremony. Fish ponds, fishing, farming, uh, all that kind of stuff. This, we took all the information we had from Haena um, and, and put it into an image. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're trying to understand, like I said earlier, is, okay, it's really obvious if you're doing ahupua restoration, you've got to restore this fish, uh, restore this taro patch, restore this fish pond. But what about all that area uh, in the Mauka areas? Like I said, it goes from the area right behind the garden all the way up to 3,200 feet in the cloud forest with a whole different kind of plant community up there. And one thing that we know is there's these different biological, biocultural zones that uh, existed in Ahupua'a. Um, and these biocultural zones dictate practices and um, what's appropriate, what's not, uh, what isn't. They exist on a gradient as you go up through the Ahupua'a. Um, they're correlated with ecological zones in a lot of ways. Um, and there have been five that have been identified for the island of Kauai. So you remember me talking about doing the Research, uh, researching into the newspapers and things like that. So one of the things I'm looking at is what biocultural zones are actually documented from the island of Kauai, and I've come up with these five. Um, and when I'm trying to figure this stuff out in the context of Hawaiian, um, you know, the, the land is broken up into all these different areas, uh, these different designations, and a lot of them start with the prefix kua. And you guys have heard of a lot of these. There's kuahivi. What does kuahivi mean? Mountain, yeah, and Kualono is a ridge, and Kualapa, and Kualipi, and all these other things. And what is what, that's a whole other presentation. But the, other, the thing that I'm really interested in is a wow. Because a kua is a physical, something physical on the landscape. It's going to be a kuahivi, whether it's covered, covered in forest, or bare lava, or condominiums. It's going to be a kuahivi. But a wow is only going to be a wow depending on the, the biology that exists there and the, and the cultural interactions of the place. And so these are some of the wow terms that exist in, in the context of the Hawaiian language. This is just a few of them. Um, there are more. Um, but like I was saying, they're, they weren't, these were recorded from in the context of Hawaii Island to Maui to Lanai, Molokai, all the way to Kauai and Ni'ihau. And you, you, one assumption is that all of these things is, existed on every island. And, and it looks like it wasn't. There were some that were specific to Hawaii Island, some that were spe specific to Kauai, and so some of my research has been trying to figure out which ones are belong here on Kauai. But kind of going through these, we have the Waukanaka. The Waukanaka is the habitation, the agricultural zone. It's where you have your fish ponds. It's where you do your rec recreation. This is basically the realm of the people, where people are kind of they're, 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 uh, dominating the area and their activities are dominating the area. Um, it's kind of, if you, if you guys have ever seen the, uh, some of the work that Sam Gan has been doing and is presentations on the Hawaiian footprint. It's all looking at this Waukanaka zone. Um, the next zone up is the Waula'au. The Waula'au is the lowland forest, so right above the area where everybody has their farms and their houses. And this is the area where you want to maximize your biodiversity. 
Um, it's highly augmented due to the integrated agroforestry that's happening here because, you know, we didn't have uh, Home Depot in the old days, so you're going to have to go get your fuel and your construction materials and your medicine and everything that you, that you need in life, but you don't need every day, is going to be in your lowland forest, and that's uh, what the Wau La'o was. Uh, the next one up above that is the Wau, uh, Wau Nahele, or sometimes referred to as the Wau Eva. It's a really remote forest. It's very highly inconvenient to access. Um, it's primarily a native plant community, uh, kind of the bird catching zone. And I think the major difference here is just how remote it was in, in the context of where everybody was spending most of their time. Uh, there were, I don't think there were any kapus um, associated with this. Like you could, if you needed a, a piece of wood, you could go up there and cut it, but why the heck would you go up to 2,000 feet if you just took care of your, the forest next to you? Um, so that was the, the remote forest above all of that. Uh, minimally, minimally augmented, not too much kukui trees or tea leaf or thing like, things like that. Um, then the next level above that is the waukele. This is the area of the forest that's perpetually saturated. And you always have this kind of seepages coming out of the side of the mountain. Um, but this is still below the cloud line, uh, what, the areas that we call the upland cloud forest. It's really inconvenient to access, very cold. Um, you know, we have a lot of people in, in the work that I do spend a lot of time up here. And you don't want to spend more than 24 hours up there. It's very uncomfortable, unless you have a nice warm cabin or something. But um, again, minimally augmented, not too much uh, change happening there. Um, and then the, the last one is a Wawakua. This is a term that many of us may have heard of before. A Wawakua is the sacred forest, the realm of the gods, uh, the montane cloud forest. Um, it's what corresponds to our core watershed nowadays. It's uh, primarily a native plant community. If it's the realm of the gods, you wouldn't want to go up there and, and mess around with it too much, planting kukui trees and tea leaves. Um, and in order to maintain the sanctity of the area, it was uh, probably had a lot of kapu associated with it, so a lot of cultural restrictions and laws against uh, that um, maybe restricted uh, access unless under very special circumstances, so not augmented at all. Um, and so this is a foundation of some of the research that we've been working on uh, at NTBG, and we basically wanted to see if we could create a model and, and figure some of this stuff out and, and where we're in our, uh, some of these zones and things like that. And I do need to uh, give a little disclaimer here. I don't claim that this is how it ever existed. What we tried to do is we tried to, uh, using this research and creating a model for Haena that, we seem, that seems to work well based on what we're seeing in the landscape and what we know of how things were divided. And then we applied the model to the whole island. And this is what we got. So basically, I'm going to go really quick. But um, this is a GIS model that was based on things like the things that were identified as the agricultural zone for the island. But you remember those polygons I showed you earlier that corresponded with the agricultural sites in the upper valley? These weren't in the zone, so we knew that that, model, um, that foundation wasn't going to be good enough. So we did uh, various tricks in using GIS technology. Um, and we, we figured out the zone. So that this red area is the well, uh, well Kanaka, the orange area, well Laau, the lowland forest. Going up above that, the well Nahele, the remote forest. Um, and then going up above that, we needed to figure out where the Wa'akua was, or where's, where's the realm of the gods? How do you figure out that out in the context of a GIS model? And so my co-author, uh, Matty Lucas, who's a GIS wizard, he somehow collected all the cloud data for the last 50 years and came up with this. This is the cloud data for the last uh, 50 or 30 years where the island is covered at least 50% of the time. And then we looked at where that actually intersected with uh, any land masses, and that comes with this. And that's how we created the zone for the Wawakua. Um, and then we kind of double checked our work. We looked at some of the other models. This is uh, Sam Gon's work that he did looking at the Hawaiian footprint. It works well for that. Um, but there are some little things that fall out that don't quite make sense. Like this is uh, Kipu Kai over here. And all of it is corresponding to Waunaheli or the remote forest. And we know that Kipu Kai definitely had habitation, things like that. Um, also, this area over here isn't quite making sense, um, but that's fine because what we try to do is we try, just try to create a model, a model of understanding and see what we could, if we could um, at least get a visual of what things would have looked like so it makes sense that it doesn't fit exactly. That's, we're okay with that. Um, so this is uh, our model for what uh, Limahuli is. So all of these agricultural sites fit into the Waukanaka. Then you have your lowland forest, your remote forest, your super wet saturated forest, and your Wawakua. 
And we are fortunate enough to, seems like we had all those five zones in the old days. And um, let me see. Another way we kind of went back and checked our work just to see if we're accurate is we looked at the botanical footprints, tea leaf, banana, sugarcane, I'm not sugarcane, uh, kukui, and other things like that that we still have some ancient trees in the forest and they all fit really well with our model. Um, so it's kind of just a way of cross-checking our work and seeing if we might be onto something and it seems like we might be close to something. Um, so there are several applications of this research. Uh, one of them is being a foundation for communication between global science and indigenous science. Um, and that's something that uh, a lot of us are dealing with nowadays. Uh, another one is educating about the conservation ethic of ancient Hawaiian culture, um, which is really important for us to do nowadays as well for a lot of reasons. Um, and then also informing the directions of our conservation actions. So like I said, my job at Limahuli is to basically have a, a community-based conservation program that is founded in culture and science. And this is, uh, this, so this kind of research is helping me to um, have direction in, in the work that we do over there. Uh, so modern applications, we have the Waukanaka as kind of our food land zone. Um, so we're doing this at Limahuli. Uh, how, how to develop agricultural uh, agriculture sustainably and things like that. Uh, modern application of the Waulau. This is um, some, some of you guys may have heard uh, people talking about food forests. This is kind of the food forest concept, but also how to manage so you have uh, good materials for other uses. Yeah, the, the Home Depot zone, uh, construction material, fuel, and things like that. Um, and this is where a lot of hunting is happening nowadays. And I think that's, that's uh, something that um, we wrestle with in the, in the conservation realm, what are we supposed to do with hunting? Reality is hunting is not going to go away, so how do we figure out how to make it fit? And for us, it's, it's fitting well in, into this Wawala Ao zone. So we still allow traditional cultural access for the, the native Hawaiian hunters in our community, and this is where they come and hunt, and they get the pigs out for us, and um, it's a win-win for all of us. Uh, we're how, trying to work on that area of how to be a resilient forest in the context of the 21st century. Um, working with uh, novel species assemblages, but I'm not going to go into too much into that today. Uh, Wao Nahele, the remote forest zone, um, really the upland forest where we're, we're some of these areas we're starting to do some fencing to protect the native plant populations. Uh, other areas like Koke'e, you have some hiking and things like that, maybe some ecotourism. Um, hunting probably be okay in some degraded areas, but we would like to try and keep the, the native uh, plant communities intact if at all possible. Uh, Waukele, same kind of thing. This is our core watershed. This is where our drinking water, a large part of it comes from, where it uh, permeates into the, the aquaculture. So fencing might be appropriate uh, in places like this. Habitat restoration would be really important if we want to try and keep as much fresh water as we have, as we can on the island. And of course, in the Waukua, this is somewhat controversial, but for us, to protect the Waukua is really important for cultural reasons. And so we fenced this area off, gotten the pigs out, trying to work on um, making sure that this sacred forest, and it really does feel sacred when you go up there, it's just, you're in such awe of, of everything. It's, it's so hard not to be touched uh, spiritually when you're up there, but really protecting that and having a, a restricting access only being uh, for those who are really taking care of the place. Um, so if you could just imagine what Kauai might look like if in this 20, in the, as we kind of navigate into the 21st century, we're able to bring some of these concepts back and and help us to make sure that our island is abundant with fresh water and biodiversity, but done so in a way that doesn't keep people out of the forest. Because we need to have people in the forest. We need people to be emotionally connected and intellectually engaged with what's happening up there because whatever is happening up there is gonna affect us down here. And we need people to embrace that and understand that. And so the more you can keep people in the forest, the better, but we need to figure out how to do it so it doesn't hurt the forest when we're up there. Um, so anyway, this, this just makes me think of more research questions, um, but I'm probably um, made out of time, so I'll just end it here and say mahalo for your time and your attention. And maybe we have a few minutes for yeah. questions. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Yes. The wall zones. Did you get that from the newspaper solely, or a combination? Yeah. yeah, so the, the question is, um, where, did this, where did I kind of come on this wow terminology? And it definitely is discussed in 
Malo and Pukui and Kamakao, they all talk about it. The problem with that is all three of them are writing from Hawaii Island genealogies and Hawaii Island knowledge systems. And you know, people here on Kauai are really sensitive with having Hawaii Island things imposed on, on this island. So I tried to honor that and say, okay, well, I'm just gonna assume that none of that existed on Hawaii. Um, maybe it existed, but in a different, it was applied in a different way. So I kind of went into it like that with fresh eyes, not considering that Hawaii Island, the way Hawaii Island did things is the way everybody did things. I think uh, too many people make that mistake. And so what I did was I went through, uh, tried to find in the old newspapers any reference of the term wow in a documented oral history, um, so a mo'olelo for the island of Kauai. And that's how I came up with those five. Those are the five that I came across. There could be more. If anybody of you guys have that knowledge in your family, it'd be really cool to know. But based on what I've seen in the newspapers, there were at least uh, five. Okay, yes? On the map on which you showed, you guys are questioning the zone. Yeah, but there was one where you had a circle. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. also had the Mana area circle. Is it one of those, no, the one down the pine, uh -huh. where there was a very large pink for Hawaiian footprint area, and you had a mm -hmm. blue circle around that. I yeah. Isn't that pretty well attested as floating gardens? Yes, good point. Uh, it is, uh, but I myself, I, I'm not from that area. I'm not living and working in that area. It was something that kind of just popped out. It was like, we're not sure if this makes sense. So um, it'd be really great to get some, some uh, consult with some people on that side and, and see if we can really figure things out. But those uh, floating, floating uh, gardens were certainly documented from there and, and a really amazing technology that would be good to know about. Yes. How did you say we access the newspapers? Um, Papa Kilo. Um, just do a word search for Papa Kilo. P A P A K I L O. I'm not sure of the exact website, but it'll come up if you type in Papa Kilo. Yeah, it's uh, it's under OHA's uh, one of their initiatives. Ulukau, yeah. Ulukau is a great resource. Two weeks ago. That's a great question. I think what you're, you're very astute in your observation that there's a, a new generation of researchers that have access to things that previous generations hadn't. 
and, and we're, we're kind of coming at it with fresh eyes. And a lot of what we're coming up with does kind of fly in the face of what our predecessors have done. Um, but, you know, Kamana is really great. I, I have a lot of respect for him. And he, 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 is, he navigates that really well. He, he checks in with a lot of those people and, and they get his advice. Like John Osorio, who is his uh, advisor when he was getting his PhD, John Osorio has had this complete regime shift in his mind of, of how things work because of Kamana's research. And I think when you are a researcher, and especially if you've been doing something your whole life, you get emotionally attached to it. And I think it, it's the disciplined researcher who is really open to when new, when new data pops up of adjusting your, your model and un, your understanding. And um, that's just the nature of research. And I think Kamana and, and the generation you know, that, that we're all in right now is is kind of the, the newer generation coming up and we're finding these new pieces that the older ones maybe didn't have and, and we're trying to, like we're ultimately we're all trying to do the same thing. We're just trying to get a better idea of, of what this puzzle looked like and we're coming up with a few more pieces that the previous generations didn't have access to. Does it have only um, scholarly import and historical understanding import or does it have any legal? Oh, oh, man. <laughs> I will not touch that one. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decline comment. Wow. Respectfully. I didn't know. <laughs> Go ahead. How did sugar uh, respond to the Apuwa? Sugar? Mm -hmm. In the 1800s. How did sugar respond? How did it change? Um, well, I think sugar came in and, and they... Uh, you know, this is a lot of speculation on my part, but I, my understanding is sure came in and they just looked at this landscape with a completely different worldview, and um, they didn't necessarily the boundaries and, and borders and, and things that were set up in the Hawaiian system. They kind of didn't pay attention to that, and in a lot of areas, just bulldozed and made these big cane fields where these pesky rock walls got in the way. And so, um, you know, I think the sugarcane plantations kind of ripped the, 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 that layer of skin off. And, and once that wasn't there, because you know, people come to Limahuli and say, wow, look at these terraces. They're so amazing. But you know, those terraces were everywhere before. But I think what happened was in the, in the sugarcane era, a lot of those got bulldozed. And when you don't have that visual or that guide, um, like this model we created in Limahuli, those, those walls are so important in our understanding of how the system worked and all of that. And when you don't have that, you're really clutching at straws and, and you don't have that foundation to build on. It's kind of been ripped away. So um, I'm not sure if... You don't have an equitable way to grow pineapple or sugar as well if you remove it. Oh, right. Yes. Do you think people would have noticed that? Uh, well, I think some did. <laughs> Painfully in some cases, but yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. There's a lot of information to absorb. Uh, are you published at all? Um, so where? This one, we're working on a publication of this. Uh, I'm just finalizing the manuscript, uh, hoping to send it off to Pacific Science. Um, uh, Kamana has been publishing. Uh, so this is getting out there, slowly but surely. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, thank you, everybody, and thank you to the Historical Society for having me. <laughs> <laughs>